Hi, this is Leonard Lopate. You're listening to WNYC On Demand. Podcasts, streaming, and MP3 downloads available when you want to listen at WNYC.org and iTunes. Now, rumors run rampant. No one here knows what has happened, but the rumors continue to circulate that the President and Governor Connolly both have been shot. And here at the Trade Mart, we have nothing but rumors and a wild scene of chaos. This is Gordon McLennan from the Trade Mart in Dallas. And that was a broadcast from KLIF, the uh, radio station in Dallas, uh, right after the assassination of President Kennedy. Rumors were flying, and polls indicate that over three-quarters of the American public believe that the assassination of President John F. Kennedy involved some sort of conspiracy. Some even claim that Lee Harvey Oswald wasn't the killer. In his latest book, Vincent Bugliosi, a former prosecutor and the author of the best-selling Helter Skelter and Outrage, has sifted through a mountain of evidence in an effort to put every major and even some minor conspiracy theories to rest. The book, Reclaiming History, The Assassination of John F. Kennedy, is published by Norton. It is my great pleasure to welcome Vincent Bugliosi back to my show. It's Happy always to a be pleasure. on your show, Leonard. It's always great to be on your show. When people mention, uh, when I mention I'm going to be on your show, they say Leonard is the man in New York City. So <laughs> I'm wow. honored to be on the show. And I thank all of those people. Why do you think so many continue to believe that there was a conspiracy <laughs> to kill President Kennedy, even people who weren't born in 1963? Yeah, well, we can probably paraphrase Joseph Goebbels, the propaganda minister of Hitler's Third Reich, that if you push something at someone long enough, eventually they're going to start buying it, particularly if they haven't been exposed to any contrary view. And these conspiracy theorists, they have inexhaustible patience, and through their books and radio and TV talk shows, movies, uh, college lectures, over the years, the shrill voice of the conspiracy theorists finally penetrated the consciousness of the American people and succeeded actually in totally discrediting the Warren Commission and convincing uh, the overwhelming majority of Americans that Oswald was either a part of a conspiracy or just some patsy who was framed by uh, some elaborate group of conspirators ranging from anti-Castro Cuban exiles to organized crime working in league with U.S. intelligence. But I can tell you, uh, Leonard, that this is all pure, unadulterated moonshine. Uh, The conspiracy theorists have dominated the debate. Nine out of ten books are pro-conspiracy books. But if the Warren Commission (laughs) report didn't have so many holes to be poked through it, would these people be as effective as they are? But they really don't have that many holes to poke through it. I, I was speaking to a, uh, a group of about 600 lawyers back east after the JFK movie. and uh, Do you blame Oliver Stone for well, perpetuating he, 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 yes, this whole yes. thing? And anyway, I asked for a show of hands as to how many people believed in a conspiracy theory. And about 90% raised their hands. And then I said, uh, how many of you saw the JFK movie or at any time in the past, read a conspiracy book or an argu- uh, an, uh, a magazine article or a column propounding the conspiracy theory. Again, a forest of hands, 90%. And I said, well, you know, I don't really need a show of hands for my next question. I said, I think you all agree that before you form an, an opinion on, a, on an important issue, you should hear both sides of the story. Like the West Virginia Mountaineers said, no matter how thin I make my pancakes, they always seem to have two sides. So I say, with that in mind, I said, how many of you have read the Warren Report? And it was embarrassing. A couple, uh, a very small handful of people raised their hands. They haven't even read the Warren Report. The Warren Report clu- uh, conclusively proves Oswald's guilt. In the area of conspiracy, they're a little weak in that they don't go into many conspiracy theories, which I do in Reclaiming History. Well... The conspiracy theories start very early. Bobby Kennedy believes that there's some kind of conspiracy, according to David Talbot's new book. Uh, there were other movies that preceded it. I remember one that Robert De Niro starred in uh, yeah. that, uh, I guess, uh, uh, Brian De Palma had directed. Yeah. And uh, this is something that is, I guess, has been there since 
the first day. Yeah. As far as Robert Kennedy, obviously his first thoughts, well, the first thoughts of LBJ, are the communists involved or is the right wing involved because of Kennedy's pro-civil rights legislation? Uh, but these were initial thoughts. But uh, in due time, Robert Kennedy is uh, very strongly on the record saying that he believed that uh, the Warren Commission was uh, correct. Now, what got you started in uh, on this? Was it that mock trial <laughs> yeah. that you engaged in 20 years ago? Yeah, we, we like to call it something other than a mock trial. Certainly it was a mock trial, but as I'm talking to you at this moment, there are mock trials going on in law schools all over the country, and this was a, a little different than that. Um, we had the original Warren Commission witnesses, a regular federal judge, uh, uh, the Jerry Spence. You've heard of him. Mm -hmm. Jerry Spence. He's uh, been on the show. He claimed he, to never have lost a, a yeah, major case. <laughs> yeah, right. Jerry Spence defended uh, Oswald. There was no script. They said, uh, Mr. Bogliosi, we know you have a, a, in a, in a moor, a love affair with your yellow pad. Your yellow pad is going to be your script. Spence and I worked on this for five months. Uh, we were on film for 21 hours, and the jury came back with a verdict of guilty. And uh, while I was on that case, dealing with the original Warren Commission witnesses, that was my initial exposure to the case, I found that this was all nonsense. So I decided to do a book at that time. Well, do you think that your experiences as a prosecutor make you less likely to believe conspiracy theories anyway? No, it would be more likely because I've prosecuted many conspiracy cases. I mean, I've put people on death row because they conspired to commit murder, even though they were not at the scene. Manson yeah. was not at the scene, you know. The text is 1,600 pages long, and there's an additional 1,000 pages in notes. Did it have to be that long? <laughs> Well, it's the first book that covers the entire case. You didn't no, want to leave any loose ends. No, no. No book uh, prior to Reclaiming History has even attempted to cover the entire uh, case. This covers everything. Uh, there's another reason why the book is so long. There are, there are two realities in this case. Uh, the first reality, Leonard, is that within hours of the shooting in Dealey Plaza, virtually everyone in Dallas law enforcement, I'm talking about the Dallas uh, Police Department, Dallas Sheriff, local office of the FBI, uh, they, 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 it was obvious to them that Oswald had killed Kennedy. I mean, he did, the, he did everything indicating that he was guilty. He ran from, he fled from the um, book depository building. It was his weapon, etc. So they were convinced that Oswald was guilty. And once they found out what a kook he was, they said, no one's going to conspire with this guy. Uh, well, you, your original question is what now? Let me get back. I, I think we're still back to 1,600 pages plus oh, oh, 1,000 yes, yeah, pages. Oh, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Um, so... It was pretty obvious, pretty obvious that uh, Oswald killed Kennedy and he acted alone. And it's basically a simple case. And this reality exists to this, to this very moment that I'm talking to you right now. But there's a second reality. Here's the second reality. Because of the, the uh, fanatical obsession, the unceasing fanatical obsession of literally thousands upon thousands of conspiracy theorists and Warren Commission critics who have investigated every conceivable aspect of this case for close to 44 years and made hundreds upon hundreds of allegations, this simple case, Leonard, has been transformed into its present form. And if I can tell you what its present form is, here's its present form. It is currently the most complex murder case by far in world history. Just to give you an example, uh, one of my endnotes, I'm not talking about the main text now, just one endnote on acoustics in manuscript form ran to about 120 pages with 60 footnotes. So that's that's almost why, a book. Yeah, so that's why this book is so long. Not because this is not a simple case. This is a simple case, but it's no longer simple because of the conspiracy theories. My guest is Vincent Bugliosi. His latest book is uh, an enormous tome called Reclaiming History, The Assassination of President John F. Kennedy. It's published by Norton. So let's go over some of those those unclear areas. Okay. How many shots were fired at Kennedy? Three shots were fired. Some uh, people the, say four. Yeah, well, the majority, uh, the vast majority heard three shots. Uh, Dealey Plaza resounds with echoes, and there was some confusion. Uh, one person, one spectator, thought he heard eight shots, but three shots were fired. And I have a photo in Reclaiming History uh, taken right after the shooting, and it shows three cartridge casings right below that sixth-floor window. Now, the president's head moved backward after he was shot, 
and that has been interpreted as uh, meaning that the bullet entered from the front. Right. And then there is also the matter of the exit wound above the entrance point of the bullet that went through John F. Kennedy's back, and uh, that doesn't make sense if we think that Oswald was shooting from a position above where the Yeah, but no was. one is suggesting that the assassin was lying on the street either, shooting upwards. Uh, I have a photo in the book. Uh, Kennedy had been waving his hands through the uh, uh, motorcade, and the photo in the book is taken two and a half seconds before the first shot, and his suit is all bunched up. You can't even see the white collar, and that's why the entrance wound was lower on the suit than it was on the actual entrance wound. Now, you asked a very good question uh, about the head snap to the rear indicating a shot from the front. If you look at the film, uh, there's no question that you see this head snap to the rear. Spence in London showed the Dallas jury that segment five times. He said it looked like Babe Ruth took a bat and slugged the president from the front. This is the Zapruder film. Uh, the Zapruder film, yes. And uh, if I hadn't had an answer to that, there would have been a reasonable doubt, and the jury probably would have come back with a not guilty verdict. As you know, the jury in London came back with a, guilty, uh, with a verdict of guilty. If you look at the individual frames, as opposed to the film, you cannot see it if you look at the film. You have to look at the individual frames. At frame 312, you see the president's head. It's okay. At frame 313, one-eighteenth of a second later, there's 18.3 frames per second. You see the explosion to the president's head at frame 313. And in what direction is the president's head pushed? It's pushed forward at frame 313, indicating what? A shot from the rear. So at this all-important moment of impact, which you cannot see on the film, at this all-important moment of impact, the president's head is, is, is propelled forward, indicating what? A shot from the rear. And then at frames 314 to 321, the head backwards. snapped to the rear, the near muscular reaction. But that's a very good question. And then some conspiracy theorists refer to the bullet that struck both Kennedy and Governor John Connolly, uh, who was seated in front of the president, as a magic bullet. Okay, but he wasn't seated in, in front. He, he wasn't, he wasn't. I mean, he was seated to the left front. This magic bullet thing is just a fraudulent creation of the conspiracy theorists. Uh, what they do in their sketches, uh, Leonard, they put Connolly directly in front of Kennedy. So therefore, a shot coming from the right rear, passing through soft tissue on a straight line through Kennedy's body, to hit Connolly would have to make a right turn in midair and then a left turn to go on and hit Connolly. The only problem is... Uh, if you start out with an erroneous premise, everything that follows makes a heck of a lot of sense. The only problem is that it's wrong. If you look at the Zapruder film and many, many, many still photographs, Connolly was not seated directly to, to Kennedy's front. He was seated in a jump seat. He was to the president's left front and lower. The orientation of Connolly's body vis-a-vis -vis Kennedy was such that a bullet passing on a straight line through soft tissue had nowhere else to go except to go on and hit Governor Connolly. Now I want to take this a little further. In London, a doctor testified for Spence to the magic bullet. So on cross-examination, I said to him, well now, now doctor, uh, you say the bullet did not go on to hit Governor Connolly. And he says, right. He said it would have to be a magic bullet. I said, well, if it didn't hit Connolly, how come it didn't tear up the interior of the limousine uh, or hit the driver? He says, I don't know. I says, well, now, if it didn't hit Connolly and it didn't hit the interior of the limousine and didn't hit the driver, it must have zigzagged to the left. He says, no, it need not have z uh, zigzagged to the left. I said, did it hop, skip, and jump over, <laughs> over the car? He said, no, it did not have to do anything like that. And I said, what happened to this bullet? And he says, I have no idea. So what it turns out now is that if we buy the conspiracy argument, once this bullet exited the president's throat, it virtually vanished into thin air, vanished without a trace. That is the magic bullet. The conspiracy theorists have the magic bullet, not the Warren Commission. We have to go to a little break in just a moment. But uh, I, before we go, um, is the Zapruder film the 22nd long film right, taken right. by 
someone who is just a bystander, the best evidence there as to what actually happened? Uh, I point out uh, five reasons in the book that even if we take the Zapruder film away, there's no question at all that uh, they were hit by that second bullet. Uh, but it's certainly it's helpful. But, th- but there's no audio on it. So you, you, you cannot tell with 100% certainty, with the exception of frame 313 where it, when he's hit in the head, you cannot tell with 100% certainty exactly when the shots uh, uh, were fired. When the Zapruder film was shown on TV in the 1970s, it created such an outrage that it led to the formation of the House Select Committee on Assassinations. Well, yeah, because that head that snapped to the rear. Uh, people looked at it and said, wait a while, the shot had to come from the uh, grassy knoll from the front. But if you look at the individual frames, at that all-important moment of impact, the president's head is pushed forward. My guest is Vincent Bugliosi, and his latest book is Reclaiming History, the Assassination of President John F. Kennedy. It is published by Norton. We will continue our conversation after we take a little break. Stay with us. Roy, uh, it appears at this point that it will take nothing short of a miracle, medical or otherwise, for Lee Harvey Oswald to face trial or charges for the assassination of President Kennedy. And a new report just now coming in from Parkland Hospital. Oswald is dead. Lee Harvey Oswald has died at the hands of a Dallas nightclub operator. Another clip from KLIF in Dallas, which provided blow-by-blow coverage of the assassination and the aftermath of it as it unfolded. Stations across the country turned to KLFI, KLIF for information on November 22nd and all the days that followed. And all the days that followed are part of what Vincent Bugliosi covers in his 1,600-page book with a 1,000 pages more of footnotes. It's called Reclaiming History, the Assassination of President John F. Kennedy, published by Norton. And uh, uh, let's talk a bit about Lee Harvey Oswald, or, or as they call him, Lee H. Oswald at that <laughs> point. Um, is there any evidence that Oswald came into his job at the depository that day with the rifle that killed the president? Is there any evidence of it? Well, yeah, he was storing the rifle at uh, Ruth Payne's uh, garage, and uh, we know he came out the night before the assassination to get that rifle. We know he put it in a in a bag, which was found right next to the three cartridge cases, of course, uh, the next day uh, in the sniper's nest, and he brought that large bag containing the rifle into the uh, building. Uh, the, the driver of the car, Buell Fraser, saw him take that large bag into the building. That bag was found right below the sniper's nest there. What was Lee Harvey Oswald like? Was he intelligent? I thought he was. Some people said he wasn't, but I thought he was intelligent, uh, intellectually uh, inclined, uh, kind of a complex guy. He was dyslexic, and yet, strangely enough, a voracious reader uh, of serious uh, uh, subjects. Uh, Certainly bonkers, there's no no question about that. Very uh, uh, emotionally uh, unstable. Uh, unreliable. The, the, the one thing that struck me more about Oswald than anything else, he was a very angry, angry person, uh, very uh, argumentative, uh, confrontational. He had defected to the Soviet Union, and that hadn't worked out. That's right. Well, he went there uh, looking for Marxism, and he was told by the State Department over there, he said, well, you're going to be awfully lonely over here if you're looking for Marxism. <laughs> Later, he tried to get a visa to Cuba and was denied that. They denied him the in-transit uh, visa. Now, 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 if they had granted it to him, he wouldn't have been in, uh, in uh, uh, Dallas at the time the president came there. But that was one of the reasons some people conjectured that there was a Cuban connection to the assassination. Yeah, but there's, there's no Cuban connection. There, there, there's no evidence. It's all theorizing, all speculation. So let's give us a little summary, a little summation of the arguments for a conspiracy and the arguments against. Well, I can't give any arguments for, uh, except that... Well, you've gone through them all. Well, no, but I knocked them down. I knocked them down. Well, for instance, they'll say the the mob killed Kennedy because they were trying to get Bobby Kennedy off their back and stuff like that. But, and, uh, but the Cubans, uh, there had been rumors that uh, that uh, they, that there might be an assassination when JFK went to Florida. So there yeah, were, well, there were the, all the sorts argument of was the Bay of Pigs. They try to overthrow Castro, so Cuba then is going to try to kill Kennedy. And uh, as Castro said, we're not going to be blown back to the Middle Ages. I mean, my, my God, and we're not going to use someone like like uh, like Oswald, who was a pro-Castro sympathizer. <laughs> 
And Bobby kind of thought it might be Cuban exiles. Well, he didn't know because he was involved in the in the uh, the, the Bay of Pigs invasion uh, and all of that. So obviously the thought entered his mind about retribution. But then when Saner Consul prevailed, there was no evidence of it. So what motive would Lee Harvey Oswald have had for killing the president? He'd no had one, a fight no with one, his wife. No one the knows the before? answer to that question uh, because he's dead. And even if he were alive and wanted to tell us, he probably couldn't tell us uh, of all the dynamics swirling around in his fevered mind that led to this monstrous act of, uh, of murder. But I can tell you a couple things from the uh, uh, available evidence. Uh, he had delusions of grandeur. He viewed himself in a historical light. He had a diary that he called the historical diary. Um, a squad mate of his in the Marines said that Oswald wanted to do something that people would be talking about 10,000 years from now. His wife, Marina, uh, whom I've met, uh, said that her husband compared himself to the historical figures that he read about uh, in these biographies. So uh, he did have these delusions of, of grandeur. He didn't want to just make a ripple. He wanted to change the tide of history. Getting more specific, and we've already touched on this, he, uh, he uh, revered Fidel Castro. Uh, he was an ardent supporter of the Cuban Revolution, obviously against Kennedy for the Bay of Pigs invasion, trying to overthrow Castro. Five days before the assassination, uh, Kennedy was in Miami and he gave a speech there urging the Cubans to rise up against Castro, promising prompt U.S. aid if they did. Uh, Oswald read the papers. It was a big story uh, in Dallas. So the Warren Commission and the House Select Committee feel, and I tend to agree with them, that uh, Oswald's love for Cuba uh, in killing an enemy of Castro played a role uh, thinking that he was furthering the Cuban cause. But there's one other point that I used uh, against Spence uh, in London. I was reading um, uh, Oswald's diary, and there was one entry in there that literally leapt off the pages uh, to me. He said, I've lived under capitalism and communism, and I, quote, despise the representatives. That's the key word the representatives of both systems. Now, he didn't particularly hate Kennedy. His pro-civil rights legislation appealed to Oswald, but he hated America. No question about that. Oswald hated America. And he probably viewed, and I'm just speculating here, but he probably viewed Kennedy as the quintessential representative of a society for which he had a grinding contempt. And when he was shooting at Kennedy, he was shooting at the United States of America. You uh, reveal a lot of sympathy for his mother, Marguerite, here. She denied that he'd done it to the day she died. Right. What about Marina? Didn't she initially maintain that he couldn't have done it? No, no, just the opposite. Marina, for years, uh, and testified under oath, said that obviously my husband killed Kennedy, and she uh, was very apologetic for it. But uh, by the time I spoke to her, uh, her mind had been impregnated with all these conspiracy theories, and now she feels that her husband was framed. But for years, she said just the opposite, that, that her husband had killed Kennedy. They'd had a fight the night before the assassination. Well, they they had a very unusual relationship, very tempestuous, and, um, you know, he started beating her. She would run away. He'd get down on his knees, and they'd come back. And that type of situation was not uncommon. But there was another aspect of their relationship that may have led to this killing. They each, for whatever perverse reason, seemed to be just beyond the other's reach unable to give the other what they knew the other needed. And on the night of the assassination, he goes, or the night before the assassination, he goes back to Irving where his wife and, and two children are living to get his rifle. But it was, I think, conditional. Why? Because he begged Marina, and she's testified to this, three times to come back to him. And and he said, you know, we can do it now. I'm making a dollar twenty-five an hour. I can get an apartment for the for the four of us. We'll get you a used washing machine. And playing this game to the very very end, she testified. I was smiling on the inside, okay, but on the outside I was tough, not giving him what he needed. And she said no, all right? And from that moment on, his demeanor changed, and we knew what he did the following day. 
And I feel, I'm not 100% sure, I'm 95% sure that if she had gone back to him that night, there would not have been a killing the next day. And she herself, she herself has taken on the responsibility for the murder and said, if I'd only known what he was planning to do the next day, obviously I would have gone back to him. My guest is Vincent Bugliosi, whose latest book is Reclaiming History, the Assassination of President John F. Kennedy and it is published by Norton. Ha- has any connection been found between Jack Ruby, the man who killed Oswald, and Oswald? No, no. They looked at that in a great amount of depth. No connection between Ruby and Oswald. Uh, Ruby loved President Kennedy, thought he was the greatest man uh, in history, and uh, uh, I knew his sister, and I say I knew her, I never met her, but I spoke to her over the phone several times. She lived in L.A., and uh, uh, Eva was her name, and Eva told me, she said that when President Kennedy died uh, and was shot, she said, my brother Jack, quote, cried more than when Ma and Pa died. He took Kennedy's death very, very hard, and, uh, well, when, when he shot Oswald, he said, well, someone had to shoot that son of a, a, a gun. And uh, But there was another reason involved here. He thought he was also going to become a hero. Those that knew Ruby absolutely thought that he was going to become uh, that he thought he was going to become a hero. Uh, he, he he tried to get an agent. He thought there was going to be a book, a big movie about him for doing this heroic deed. Uh, but there's no connection between Ruby and Oswald. You well, know, we have more delusions of grandeur in a way. Yeah, oh yeah, right, right. Here, here, here's an interesting point. Uh, the FBI interviewed no less than 100 people who knew Ruby very, very well. Not one of them ever even dreamed that this guy was a member of the mob, or killed Oswald for the mob. They laugh at it. It's a joke. And yet thousands of conspiracy theorists around the country who never met Jack Ruby are convinced he was this big-time mobster. Actually, the guy was a joke. Well, so many of the conspiracy theories I've heard uh, are based on association. Jack Ruby lived with this person who knew someone who was Oswald's ex-boss's roommate, and on and on and on. What's this now? He, he no, I'm just, no, no, I'm just making that up, but it's that kind of thing where... Oh, yeah, well... Oh, and then this cop died oh, well, three years later and... That Oswald was Jack Ruby's illegitimate son, too. I mean, there's, there's all types of crazy things out there. Well, let, let's go back to the, the hard evidence. Isn't part of the problem also that the autopsy uh, of President Kennedy's body um, destroyed, well, revealed that there had been some destruction of evidence because, no, no, well, they, that, they that, try that, to resuscitate a, Kennedy and and uh, and in, in, in the process had destroyed some evidence that might have helped keep things clear. The, the, this is, there's no more complete book on the assassination than Reclaiming History, and I've never read that there was a destruction of evidence at Parkland Hospital? No, not a, not a, a, a conscious destruction, but in attempts to resuscitate Kennedy. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, okay, oh, okay. The the exit wound, the exit wound uh, of, of the bullet that entered the upper right back, it exited the front of his throat, and to, 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 to save him, the tracheotomy, the tracheotomy was in the same place as the exit wound, and you're right, that, that did make it difficult to find the exit wound. But close-up photographs showed that that wound where the tracheotomy was conducted, that is where the bullet exited. But you're right. The tracheotomy, <laughs> you got a point there. The tracheotomy help, helped obscure the exit wound because it was in the same position. Now, all sorts of people that we've kind of mentioned some of them, like Fidel Castro, like the anti-Castro exiles, like the CIA the KGB, uh, Texas oil men have all been suggested as possible possible conspirators. Okay, let, 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 let me, you know, there's been billions and billions of words written about this case. If I can try to summarize uh, in a couple minutes, it's going to be difficult. Uh, let's talk about Oswald's guilt and then all of these conspiracy theories. Let's take Oswald's guilt first. As a prosecutor, I learned, and it's just common sense, that if you're innocent, chances are there's not going to be any evidence at all pointing towards your guilt. But now and then, because of the nature of life, the unaccountability of things, there may be one piece of evidence in a rare situation, even two or three pieces of evidence pointing towards guilt, even though you're completely innocent. But here, Leonard, everything, everything pointed towards his guilt. 
in Reclaiming History, I set forth 53 separate pieces of evidence pointing towards Oswald's guilt. And under the circumstances, Leonard, it wouldn't even be humanly possible for him to be innocent, at least not in the world in which you and I live. I'm talking to you. You can hear me. There will be a dawn tomorrow. Not in that world. Only in a fantasy world can you have 53 pieces of evidence pointing towards guilt and still be innocent. If we have a little time, I'll just give you just a couple of the pieces of evidence. All right. It was his murder weapon. Firearms test showed that the murder weapon belonged to Lee Harvey Oswald. There was no, there were no bullets from any other weapon. Absolutely not. Who leaves the book depository building? Many employees are. He's the only employee that flees the book depository building immediately after the killing. Forty-five minutes later, he shoots and kills Officer J.D. Tippett. The signature, the 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 the, the killing bore the signature of a man in desperate flight from some awful deed. Thirty minutes later, resists arrest, pulls a gun on the arresting officer. During interrogation, he told one provable lie after another, all of which showed a consciousness of guilt. I'm trying to summarize billions of words in a couple minutes. Conspiracy. There's been these allegations of all these groups, the mob, CIA, KGB, military-industrial complex. Leonard, there's no credible evidence that any of these groups were involved in this assassination. All there is is naked speculation. Number two... There's no credible evidence that Oswald himself had any association, any connection with any of these groups in the past. And the FBI checked his past. They checked every breath he ever breathed. No record of his having any association with any of these groups that supposedly were behind the assassination. Now, let's assume, because I want to take this step by step. Let's assume that one of these groups wanted to kill Kennedy, a notion that I almost reject out of hand. It belongs in a Robert Ludlum novel. But let's assume they want to kill Kennedy. Oswald Leonard is one of the most far-out people in the world that they would ever think of hiring as their hitman. Why? Well, number one, he was not an expert shot. He had a $12 mail-order rifle, uh, notoriously unreliable, extremely unstable. I mean, here's a guy that wanted to become a Soviet citizen. They turn him down. What does he do? He slashes his wrist, tries to commit suicide, and they're going to get him to commit the. They're going to get him to commit the biggest crime in American history. Now, let me take it to its final step. These groups decide that they want to kill Kennedy, and number two, even though Oswald's a joke, they decide they want to use him to kill Kennedy for him. Let's see if where that takes us makes any sense, okay? After Oswald shoots Kennedy in Dealey Plaza and leaves the book depository building, one of two things, Leonard, would have happened. Let me tell you the least likely thing that would have happened. There would have been a car there to drive Oswald to help him escape down to Mexico or wherever. The conspirators certainly would not want their killer to be apprehended and interrogated by the authorities. That's the least likely scenario. The most likely scenario, and I think you know what I'm going to say, Leonard, the most likely scenario, if the mob was behind this or the CIA, there would have been a car waiting for him to drive Oswald to his death. And yet we know that he's out on the street with with, with $13 in his pocket attempting to flag down buses and and cabs, okay? I mean, that fact alone. I'm trying to summarize billions of words. I, I, I understand, and I think you make a very strong case. I wonder why... District Attorney Jim Garrison of New Orleans, then, you know, who also had similar training to yours, would have tried to find some connection to Clay well, Shaw the, the, in all of this. The joke is, really, he used Clay Shaw as a patsy. Clay Shaw was a patsy. He wanted to attack the Warren Commission. Jim Garrison gets up in his final summation, and the only time he mentions Clay Shaw, if you're a prosecutor, you say Clay Shaw's guilty. Here's the evidence. The only time he mentions Clay Shaw in his final summation down in New Orleans is that you folks are here to determine whether Clay Shaw is guilty or not guilty, something that they already knew. I'm convinced that he used Shaw to really attack the Warren Commission. He thought the Warren Commission was a fraud, you know that after the verdict was uh, uh, not guilty, the, the, the Times-Picayune, the New York Times, they said, this is one of the greatest miscarriages in the history uh, of America. Uh, he was in total disrepute until Oliver Stone comes along years later, 
disinters him from his legal grave, and Stone's movie, I mean, come on, is one continuous lie. Let me, let, let me amend that. I gotta give Oliver credit. He did have the date correct. He had the victim correct. He had the location correct. But other than that, it was one continuous lie. I mentioned 53 pieces of evidence against Oswald. Uh, he couldn't find, I'm talking about Stone, he couldn't find time in his three hour and eight minute movie, I, and I, 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 you know, I understand, I mean, there just wasn't time. He couldn't find time, Len, for one single piece of evidence against Oswald to put into that movie. Now, we have no more time here, but the last two books, one is about Manson, the other in which you made the case that O.J. Simpson was the murderer. Uh, in both cases, I don't think uh, only a few people would probably not be uh, persuaded. But what about this? You have 1,600 pages plus 1,000 pages of notes. Do you think that you're going to change the minds of three-quarters of all Americans? Well, you know, it's difficult for me to talk about this case and be candid without without boasting. I hadn't had that problem with my other case, but I'm, I'm going to be with my other books, but I'm going to be candid with you even though people are going to say it's boasting. Leonard, no one ever dreamed that this book here, Reclaiming History, would ever be written. Uh, this is a book that settles all questions about the assassination uh, beyond all doubt. It's my belief, my belief, and it sounds boastful, but I'm, I'm going to be candid, that no reasonable, rational person can possibly read this book without being satisfied beyond all reasonable doubt that Oswald killed Kennedy and acted alone. The Los Angeles Times said this is a book for the ages and when I wrote the book that was my intent to write a book for the ages and the Times says reclaiming history may finally move those accusations of conspiracy beyond civilized debate. At last someone has done it, put all of the pieces together. It is a book for the ages. And tonight you can hear Vincent Bugliosi. That's at 6.30. Uh, he will be interviewed on stage by James L. Swanson, author of the bestseller Manhunt, followed by a book signing. And the event will take place at the Great Hall of Cooper Union at 7 East 7th Street on 3rd Avenue. And it is free, open to all the public. And by the way, we also would like to thank WNYC archivist Andy Lancet for getting those KLIF clips and the Otis Span track.